Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast, Episode 603. Possible issues related to the insertion of testosterone pellets for women. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at Biobalanced Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today we're going to talk about um, pellet insertions and we are going to talk about the side effects or complications that you can have if you have a pellet insertion. And I'm talking about any kind of pellet insertion, not necessarily at my office. Uh, as we have over the, over the very first year or so figured out all the ways we can limit side effects or complications. So these are just possibilities they're very rare, but they are things that you should know before you get your pellets so that you know what to expect afterwards. Expectations uh, should always be real. You shouldn't have expectations given based on your friends saying, oh, it was terrible or it was, or it was great or nothing. You know, I didn't feel anything. I did feel something. I mean, those things should be, <laughs> you should be able to have realistic expectations of your pellet insertion. So that's what we're going to talk about today. The, there are some minor complaints that we get from patients. We'll talk about those. They go away pretty quickly after the insertion and are not to be worried about. But we'll also talk about uh, the reaction to numbing medicine that some patients get. It's specific. It's based on the patient. It's not universal uh, at all. Um, possible infections, possible um, seromas, which are fluid collections around the pellet, and possible expulsions, which means the pellet comes out. So that's what we're going to talk about today. First, we'll talk about the minor uh, complaints that we get from patients, and we do give our patients a handout that says these things could happen and they will go away and they're not worrisome, but they include bruising. Sometimes we hit a little vessel. A capillary will make you bruise around where we put the pellets in. Um, redness, which can occur from uh, actually from the dressing we put on. If you have an allergy to tape or an allergy to the uh, waterproof dressing we put on, sometimes you can get a red, big red spot about like that. And that is uh, avoided by taking the dressing, uh, the tape dressing off in three hours and then taking the Steri strip off in three days. If you have allergies to steri strips, then we need to know that, and we can close the tiny two millimeter cut with something else. So that's that is is up to you telling us that you have an allergy to tape or to steri strips, or we will find out. Um, swelling usually occurs after pellets because you are we are making a tiny cut. We're putting a um, pencil thin trocar in, which is like a sharp instrument. We load the pellets in, push them in, and take that out, and then put this, the dressing on. So, that is, so swelling does occur anytime you put anything into, into your fat or into underneath the skin. You can get redness, you can get swelling, and you can get soreness. It usually goes away within three days, sometimes within a week, especially for the men because they got a lot more pellets. So that's more common in men. Some people complain of itching around the site, and uh, that can be due to the lidocaine that we use, or it can be due to the pellet itself. Usually we just have people use uh, Benadryl cream around the, around the incision, not over it, but around the outside of it. So um, those are really easy fixes. They don't last, they don't mean anything bad. Now, um, reaction to numbing medicine, we use lidocaine, we add bicarb, and most of the time, the lidocaine will have epinephrine in it. Now, the, the reason we use epinephrine is to keep you from bruising. It causes the capillaries that, um, w when we're injecting into the hip, um, when we do some kind of a procedure in the hip, all the little capillaries 
shrink with epinephrine, so we don't get as much bruising or swelling or redness. Um, some people are allergic to lidocaine, so we have an option. If you have an allergy to lidocaine, we use nesicaine. Some people should not take epinephrine, and we'll discuss that in a minute, but uh, that includes the people that get shaky with epinephrine. When we give the lidocaine and epinephrine, uh, a, a small percentage of people will get really shaky or anxious afterwards. It lasts about 20 minutes. Um, in our office, you can stay and sit and wait till that goes away until you go home, or you can do as you choose or get somebody to drive you home if you're too shaky. So uh, then we've learned something. We then put in your chart, no epinephrine. We can still use the lidocaine and, and the um, bicarb, but we don't put, use lidocaine with epinephrine. So that's something we learn per patient. <laughs> and after the first time, you won't have that because we'll use something different. Um, Bicarb that we put in there is just a pH balancer because if we just gave you lidocaine without bicarb, it would burn. So we're trying to make this painless. So the lidocaine itself can burn as it goes in. We put the lidocaine in so it doesn't. Then the, um, you won't have as much burning, itching, or anything else around that area either. The bicarb balances the pH to a pH of what blood is or tissue is so that it makes it less irritating. So that's one of the things we do specifically to uh, improve pain. We also have to um, have the numbing medicine in there long enough and we always test you before we put in a trocar after we, or even make a little cut with our number, number 11 blade. So we always test you to see if that is sharp. If it's not sharp, then you're numb. And then we can go ahead. If you are feeling pain, then we either re-inject or just rub on the area and, and until you're numb. So um, the, uh, we don't use epinephrine in certain patients. So uh, not everybody checks for these things. So I'm going to list these. I mean, we, this is our protocol, but uh, if you have had uh, reactions to epinephrine, uh, lidocaine with epinephrine in the past, then you should uh, tell your... Um, practitioner, uh, if you have heart disease, um, vascular heart disease, or arrhythmias, then the epinephrine and the lidocaine can cause problems, not the lidocaine. So we will, use epi we will use no epinephrine and we will just use lidocaine or nesicaine. Patients who have glaucoma should not have epinephrine in their numbing medicine at any time because that can make the glaucoma worse. We ask for that. And stroke patients also should not have epinephrine in their, um, in their lidocaine. Now, for example, I had atrial fib, I had it ablated, meaning it's gone, and now I can have epinephrine in, in my uh, lidocaine injection because I no longer have atrial fib. So that's one of the things after you're better or oftentimes after you've had heart stents, then we can go back to using the epi because it does make it much more comfortable and it does keep you from bruising. Um, infection uh, in the insertion site is, a, is another complication. It's very rare in our office. Very early on, we learned that betadine doesn't work to kill all the bacteria on the skin. So we use a Hibiclens like like uh, scrub that they use in surgery. And we use the scrub, do two scrubs on every area before we make any cuts or, in, or do injections into the skin. So um, lidocaine can be injected without the scrub, but making a cut or putting a trocar in requires that you be scrubbed off. Um, and we're very careful about that so that you don't get an infection. And we have very few. We give specific instructions for our patients before and after they have their pellets to not submerge in water, meaning in a bathtub, because the water is not clean, it's dirty, and it'll get into that little tiny cut. Skin heals in three days. So for three days, you don't submerge in a tub, you don't get into a swimming pool, you don't get in a hot tub, you don't get in, oh my gosh, the Lake of the Ozarks? Don't. I mean, we've had some infections from people who didn't listen to us. The Lake of the Ozarks is not clean. You cannot get in there with an open sore, you'll get an infection. So that, those are things that you should be very careful about for three days. But sometimes patients forget, and then we have to deal with the infection. Um, 
some people just don't take care of the site. I mean, if you're going to go out in the garden and you're going to have a crop top on and maybe your gym shorts kind of ride down on you, then you need to not use dirty hands over the area where your insertion was. I mean, that we've seen almost everything. So um, the treatment we do in case you do have an infection, we look at the site in the office if possible. Sometimes we have to have you take a picture. Now, one, one time I had a patient, sure, she had an infection from a pellet she had three weeks before, which is not typical. You'll have an infection right away or in the first week. So I said, can you come in? She said, no, I'm in another state. So she took a picture of her the hip that she had, and it, to me it looked like a bug bite. So I said, hmm, I looked at her chart, and I said, hmm, wrong hip. She had a bug bite on the opposite hip from where she had her pellets. So it was not a pellet infection. Anyway, so that's one of the reasons we have to ask you questions and look at the site to see if it's really an infection or something else. We look visually, if you're in the office, we have to look visually and feel it to see if it's swollen or hard or uh, we kind of squeeze it to see if there's any pus or any serum coming out. If there's a cloudy discharge or... Um, bloody discharge, swelling around the area, then in that case, we assume an infection. So we, clean, we culture the area first and send that off to make sure that we're giving you antibiotics that cover that type of infection. We clean the area, and then we either give you a script for antibiotics or inject you with antibiotics and send you home with daily dressing so that you can clean it with... Um, with um, either Hibiclans or um, peroxide, and then it should be closed within a week, maybe less, maybe three or four days. So that should take care of it within a week, and that's and if it's not, we have you come back. Um, seromas are another type of problem that we can see, we see often. Sometimes it's just that patients have a really effective immune system and they bring all their white cells there and they get a lot of serum around the pellet. That makes the skin swell, it makes it red, and it makes it hurt. Um, when you feel it, it feels kind of watery inside, like a, like a cyst or something. Uh, when we see this, once again, if you're not near the office, then we have you take a picture of it so we can see it. That isn't ideal, but uh, because we, usually we have to do something about it. Then we have you come in, we clean the area, we look at it with sterile gloves, of course, and um, we look for the swelling and the discharge, make sure it's not infection. Uh, we try to drain the fluid by just pushing. Usually there's a little tiny opening and then the serum just comes out and deflates. If that's the case, serum is not infection. It is just an overreaction to or an allergy to uh, some, either the pellet or something that we uh, injected. So we put a really tight dressing on and leave that on, and you might get you might get um, redness underneath the tape. But we leave that on for a day to keep the pressure on it, and then you can take it off. And then we do the same thing as we do with infections: give you dressing, and and you get peroxide and clean it, and then then it it's gone pretty quickly, quick quicker than infection. Expulsions. Expulsions mean that after the pellets inserted about that deep into your fat and hopefully you have enough fat to do that. Um, the pellet itself somehow works its way up and out, pushing against the skin and, and opening the skin up to get out. Like if you had a sliver, sometimes the pellet will cause that kind of reaction, rarely. Um, the symptoms are redness, swelling, pain, and a little white dot at the center of the area where we inserted the pellets and sometimes some watery discharge. So if you have an expulsion, we do what we do for infections, but we also try to push out the pellet that's, that's trying to come out. Then we treat it like an infection, give you antibiotics, and, and go down that pathway. If um, the pellet expulsion had one pellet or two pellets, then if you want to, we usually reinsert those on the other side so that you get the same dose you would have gotten before, as long as this happens in the first two months. Usually it doesn't happen after a month. 
Um, we give patients instructions, no submerging in water for, seven, for three days, no exercise for three days. Don't wear a backpack or a belt or other items that, like a, we have some police that have gun belts that ride, so we have to avoid that area when we put them in. So we need to know what you wear on a daily basis. But we can't have anything rubbing that area and disturbing the pellet so that it gets angry and starts trying to come out. We had somebody who wore a backpack immediately after getting his pellets and went hiking. Well, that's two things. One thing was that it was rubbing the area where we just put the pellet in. He didn't really feel it because he was still numb. And um, he, they, it was actually dislodging the pellet, making it able to, instead of stay where it was, come back up to the surface. So when we figured that out, then we said, no camping for you for three days. So um, we don't want you to apply creams or oils for three days. We don't, because that can get down into the, um, into the incision. And don't use foam rollers. We had one patient who would use foam rollers every day on the area we put our pellet in, and it actually dislodged the pellet. Usually the pellet gets in there and, and settles into the fat layer. Um, out, after three days, it's there. It's not going anywhere. So she would do rollers, and it would actually dislodge it and make them come out. And once we figured that out, she didn't have any more expulsions. Um, follow the instructions for the pre-treatment and the aftercare that we give you, like what I've discussed. Um, and if you're on any immune suppressive drug or uh, have an immune deficiency, tell us. That probably applies for preventing infection and for preventing expulsions, because sometimes your immune system is not working properly and will view this as, um, as a foreign body and will try to get it out so, or will cause an infection. Our treatment um, for expulsion is this. We rarely have expulsions. We figured out how not to have expulsions. Um, to diagnose, we have, we have to see the patient. And if they've had anything come out of their insertion site, we have them bring it in in a plastic bag. We take a photo of it, or they can take a photo of it at home. Um, and, and that's the way we confirm it's really an expulsion and not something else. If you have an expulsion, you'll know it. It's not something that's without symptoms. In the, in the office, we inspect and clean the area. We remove any pieces of pellet that may still be coming out um, and sterile. Uh, if there's any sign of infection, we treat the infection. We either give an, we usually give an injection. Um, if it's due to allergy and there's no sign of infection, we use antihistamines for a week, and then every time they get pellets from then on, they use antihistamines to prevent this. And we place the dressing over the area, but it has to be cleaned every day. So cleaned with peroxide and uh, dressing replaced. After the first expulsion, to prevent more expulsions, um, we may prophylax with antibiotics if they had an infection, or we'll give antihistamines if it was more of an allergic reaction. Uh, we change the pellets to cholesterol-coated pellets, which are less reactive to the fat. Therefore, they don't expulse as often, so we switch to that. And, and since men expulse more than women, we usually use cholesterol-coated uh, pellets anyway. Sometimes we change the pharmacy. If you're allergic to one pharmacy's pellets, you may not be you may not be allergic to a different pharmacy's pellets. So we change the pharmacy if we feel there's an allergy. Next time we place deeper in the fat, if at all possible, but it goes skin, fat, fascia, and muscle. Fascia is kind of around the muscle, muscle, and then fascia, and then other things you don't want us to, to uh, get into. So you want the pellet in the fat and um, if we have somebody who has very little fat, then we have to give, especially men, we give on both sides of the hip or of the um, love handles, because usually there's some fat there. Um, now, some rare problems, which, I mean, really rare, rarer than what I've just discussed, are um, scarring or keloid for formation. Now, we, if you've ever had a keloid when you had a scar, then we prophylax um, and prevent some more scar tissue by putting in just a tiny bit of Kenalog injected around the incision site and just right below the incision to keep you from forming a scar. So um, 
that works. And we need to know that ahead of time. We'd rather do that than have to try to fix the keloid afterwards. If you've never had an incision, then you won't know, and we'll have to just see how you do. The reason I re um, I redesigned the uh, trocars is because in the beginning, the trocar incision had to be three or four millimeters. But you get scar tissue when you have three or four millimeters cut in your incision. So if you have a two millimeters incision, you don't get scar tissue. So I made our trocars, especially for women, not be thick. It made them less sturdy and they didn't last as long, but honestly, uh, we made it so that you um, don't have to have scar tissue. I've had 20 years of pellets every four months, and I dare you to find where my last pellet insertion was. I mean, there's no scar. If you have itching, we use Benadryl and Zyrtec or, Clar Zyrtec or Claritin. If a patient's really thin, we have to use different places with little pads of fat because you have to have fat to dissolve the pellets. That's just a, a deal. Last problem is some people say, oh, I don't feel better. That's rare, even rarer than all these other things. So sometimes they need a higher dose of the pellets. We look at your blood level. Uh, sometimes they make a lot of estrogen and that counteracts the testosterone. So we uh, try to limit the estrogens in multiple ways. Some people just make a lot of the binding protein that binds up testosterone and, and we have to use higher doses to get a better testosterone free um, other medical problems that aren't treated can cause the pellets not to feel like they should, like uh, hypothyroidism, not treating that, not treating high cortisol. Some medications interact. Um, sometimes you have fatigue from low blood, blood sugar or high insulin levels, so we try to treat that. So those are the things that are very rare, but we treat them in the next insertion through your feedback and through your blood levels. So... I don't think I've missed anything. These are all the things that could happen and rarely happen. So I wouldn't be looking for them unless you've got a problem. And I hope you got the impression that we rarely have these issues and that you should find a doctor who does these all the time, like all day long, not somebody who does them once a week, once a month. They're not going to have the skill or the knowledge to figure out what's going wrong or what how to place them. Actually. So this is one of the things that are that's very important about choosing the person that puts your pellets in. So thank you for listening. We will be back next week with more information for you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BiobalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BiobalanceHealth.